Thank you, Steve and Tom, particularly for inviting me. I can tell by your choice of final speaker that detailed knowledge of distance education was not top of your list of criteria for who to invite. Uh, so I'm going to tell you what I do in the hope that if there's time, we might mutually ex exchange ideas uh, between ourselves. Um, I'm going to try, in theory, to balance what I say in terms of research that I do and research that is undertaken currently by the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Programme that I direct. But as a friend of mine found when he uh, interviewed several hundred young people and asked them, what's a theory? One of them said, a theory is something that doesn't work in practice. <laughs> so I have a suspicion that I probably won't get this balance between the two hats that I'm wearing right. And I want to start, well, I want to focus most of my talk on the computer as an agent of change. But I'd like to just look for a minute or two about the computer itself, at the computer itself and what is happening with computers, because I think we're poised on the edge of a very interesting phenomenon. For the first time, since I've been involved in what is now called technology-enhanced learning, the whole question of what kind of technology shall we make provision for, what kind of technology shall we give our young people, school students, university students, is beginning to go away. Because, like many of you, I have in my pocket a hugely powerful computer uh, that I carry with me everywhere which does almost anything I want except make decent telephone calls. Um, and I think that we are only just at the, as I say, a kind of tipping point where we, we have to rethink many of the things we took for granted. And I think that this, these technologies are having an amazingly ubiquitous and powerful effect on all walks of life, with the possible exception of education. Yes. Um, <laughs> You know, science has been completely, radically, and fundamentally reborn, so has the field of mathematics and so have many other subjects, including, for example, music. But education, not so. And I think that a visitor from the 19th or even 18th century dropping into one of our lectures, however technologically enhanced it might be, would be perfectly able to see that what this was, this was a group of people being taught something by somebody like me standing at the front talking to somebody like you sitting in rows of chairs. Um, when the iPad came out, uh, I thought it would be fun to see what the first app was that purported to be about mathematics education. And I found one. This is a program which doesn't even teach you how to add up. It checks that you already know how to add up. And I just find it very, very depressing that we have this incredibly powerful and beautifully designed... You can tell that I'm a, a, a gadget freak. I can't help it. Um, but we have this beautifully designed thing which is allowing us to interact with computers in a completely new way. Uh, and the best that somebody somewhere can do is to write a program that tests young children, very young children's understanding of addition. And I think actually when you get to the second level, it even does subtraction as well. On the other hand, okay, put your hands up if you know what that screen is a screen of. Uh, yeah, and, and it took some time for you to admit it, didn't it? So um, this is only the opening screen. I can't completely empathise with its popularity. Um, I came across somebody yesterday, a teacher in a secondary school, who teaches about parabolas and conic sections by introducing the class to angry birds. Um, but if your thing is shooting pigs at... Um, what are they? Uh, no, shooting birds at pigs... This is the app for you. And now your starter for 10 is how many downloads do you think this program has had in the last, well, since it was built about a year ago? So do I hear 100,000? 4 million. Do I hear 10 million? Okay. This is a big number. 
And that was, that was three weeks ago, so it's probably nearly 400 million for all I know. Now, that is a substantial percentage of the population of the Earth um, shooting birds at pigs. <laughs> and, you know, by the way, the, I, I'm sure that these 300 million are not separate people. There are people downloading it onto different machines and different platforms and so on. Never mind. It's a huge number of people. And before, it's nice, you know, I could make jokes about it for the whole of my allotted time here, but we have to try and learn what it is about programs of this kind that is so attractive and compelling. And, you know, really to progress through the levels, you need a huge commitment of time. That's why so relatively few of you, well, actually, there wasn't that many, there wasn't that few of you um, have spent any time doing it. And so here's my first kind of big point that I'd like to put to you, which is, which you can't read in this light, but it says, what people learn in formal education has to be at least as powerful and engaging as what they do at home. And I think, as I say, it's easy to sneer at uh, programs like Angry Birds, just like it's easy to sneer at trashy TV programs, but we have to learn what the engaging power of these systems is. Uh, and, well, I'll leave you with that thought. Now, let me turn to the question of the computer as an agent of change. And as you heard from the very kind introduction, I'm a mathematician at heart. And I thought I'd like to share with you a quote I came across recently from the Goldman Sachs's chief financial officer. It's a really powerful person, right? Um, and he, he was interviewed in late 19, uh, 2007, after the Lehman Brothers collapse and the beginning of the banking instability that we all now wake up every morning listening to today program hearing about. Um, and when he was being interviewed, he expressed some surprise at the events. He said, we were seeing things that were 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row. Now, for those of you who are not mathematicians, let me explain what he must have meant by that. <laughs> what he meant was, here's a, stand, here's a normal distribution, and this distribution is believed by him to control financial events, just like it sort of controls millions and millions of other social and scientific phenomena in the world. And the black vertical lines represent the spread. So you can see that within two standard deviations each way from the mean, 95 point something percent of everything occurs, three standard deviations each way, 99.7, and 25 standard deviations is in Birkbeck. <laughs> and so I asked my son, who's actually a financial mathematician, to, uh, to find out what the, how long you would have to wait for an event that was 25 standard deviations from the mean three days in a row? I won't ask you to guess. The, the answer is ten, six times 10 to the power of 124 <laughs> times the life of the universe. <laughs> and the, real, the point I want to make is not that he got it wrong, <laughs> but that he didn't bother to question whether or not his model, his mathematical model, might not be the right model. And I just have this obsession, I think I've had it all my working life, that even if we don't teach kids in schools and students in universities very much, or as much as we'd like them to know, we have to give attention to this problem of understanding the idea of models in so many subjects, not just scientific subjects, but particularly in social scientific subjects. I think this is a social scientific example, in fact. Um, and in order to do that, we have to think about knowledge. This is a friend and inspiration of mine, Seymour Papert, might be a name known to some of you, who is uh, the father of technology in learning. I think there's probably no dispute about that. And he entreats us all to spend our time, as we already do, thinking about problems of how to teach with technology, how students learn with technology, 
which students might be uh, able to learn now that weren't able to learn before. But to just save a little bit of time to do what the educational community at all levels is not so good at, and that is to think about knowledge. What is it that we're trying to help people to understand? Is it really more or less the same as it was 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or in the case of mathematics, nearly 200 years ago? Um, and that's a rhetorical question. You can tell that I think 10% of our time would be productively spent. And at the moment, if you look in educational journals, I think the issue of knowledge is severely underrepresented. And you can see why. We were handed what it is possible to teach in schools, colleges and universities by the constraints and limitations of the technologies that we had at the time those curricula were invented and those technologies were paper and pencil. Here's a two famous people using paper and pencil. Do you know who the other one is? So the other one is, not that it matters, but the other one is Robert Oppenheimer. And they're looking at something that has been produced by Einstein with a pencil and paper. And I don't know what it is, but it's either an equation or a picture. Probably a picture, actually, uh, given Einstein's visual mind, geometrical mind. And if you are limited to the technology of pencil and paper, as for most of public education we have all been, there are inevitable constraints about what is learnable and what is teachable. But my thought, and this is the second thought I want to give to you, is that some ideas look harder than they are because of the ways they're represented. So I'm going to pluck, at, literally at random, out of hundreds and hundreds of possibilities I could have chosen. Just something which, if only the sun wasn't shining on my screen, would be a beautiful phenomenon. This is a, in case you can't see it, a flock of birds. And you, we've all looked at a bird, a flock, forming itself. We've all asked ourselves, how do the birds know where to go? We've all asked ourselves, how do they all know even to fly in the same direction? And we've asked ourselves, I think, unless this is somebody's specialist field here, how, who decides which bird is the leader? Now, as I said, this is an example of one of hundreds, maybe thousands of phenomena that I could pick from the social sciences, from the arts and humanities, and from the sciences. But it, it sums up an important idea, which is, wouldn't it be great if education was about making sense of difficult to understand phenomena? And of course, if you're a mathematician, this phenomenon is extremely tractable by the traditional pencil and paper methods of mathematics. So I can see from your body language that you're completely fascinated to know what the mathematics behind this swarming flock of birds is. So I shall show it to you and then in about a couple of minutes, I'll give you a test for, of your understanding. So here's the equations which govern the movement of the birds. Uh, well, in case, you're make, in, in case this is your specialist subject, I promise you these really are the equations that govern uh, the flocking of birds, but I won't expect everybody to understand. Uh, indeed, I'm not sure that I can understand it, although I've tried. Um, but here's another way of understanding this phenomenon using a technology which is dynamic, which allows me to change things and which allows me to see the effects of my actions in practice. Now, this may be a complete failure, actually, given the sun is straight at the screen. I'm making a population of 250-odd birds, and they will come on the screen in just a second because I'm going to press a little button that says set up. Can you see those? And now they start going randomly in all directions. And very, very quickly you see that they're all starting to clump together and they're going in the same direction. Now, how did that model get built? And the answer is there are only two rules. And each bird has the same rule. It's rule one, check out which bird is nearest to you. And rule two, move, turn slightly towards that bird. 
There are details, I will suppress them. Each bird only knows two little things and every bird knows the same thing. And yet out of that apparently random behavior with only every bird knowing so little, there emerges a global phenomenon. Of course, this is only a model. The clumping of the birds isn't a beautiful flock like my photograph was. And we shouldn't be surprised. This, this phenomenon happens everywhere. You take a coin, you toss it ten times, you get seven or eight heads, you know that that doesn't mean that the coin is biased. You, you toss it ten million times, you get seven or eight million heads, you know the coin is biased. Just tossing a coin where the coin knows nothing is enough to have emerging from the other end of repeated trials of, such a, uh, of, of the action, emerges with a, a real phenomenon that needs to be understood. And it turns out, there's a whole branch of science called complexity theory which is pervading not only the sciences, but particularly the social sciences as a way of understanding difficult to learn, difficult to understand phenomena. So that's my personal crusade, is to try and make ideas learnable that were previously not learnable at all. The number of people who could understand the equations is measured in thousands. The number of people who could play with the phenomenon as a computer model is numbered in billions, potentially. Now, please don't think that I want you to run away and study flocks of birds, but if you, look, if you want to Google complexity, you'll see that this really is an applicable idea much more widely. Okay, now it's, I don't know, I want, wouldn't mind some time left for discussion, so I'm going to just spend a few minutes changing gear, uh, changing the balance between my own personal obsessions and the obsessions of those who are academically nearest me in the Technology Enhanced Learning Program, Research Program. This is a program jointly funded by the ESRC and the EPSRC. And that was really, really exciting when it was launched in 2007 because if you're a social scientist interested in technology, you could up to then have gone to the ESRC who would say, we'll fund the social science but we're not paying for any computer science. That's somebody else's job. Or you could go to the EPSRC and they'll say, we'll fund the computer science, but we're not for, uh, paying for all this airy-fairy education stuff. Uh, and so when the two funding councils actually came together and made £12 million available for research projects that spanned in an interdisciplinary way the two fields of computing sciences and learning sciences, that was a surprising and very welcome move and in fact even though the sun's in my eyes I can see a handful of people here who are working on projects in the uh, research program so welcome to, special welcome to you but great to see you here um, there were four major themes that the program was launched with and they are flexibility which is the nearest we come I think to distance education but also inclusion I think distance education and inclusion, you don't need me to draw you a roadmap of the connection between those two concepts. Um, personalization, which at the time, you, do you remember the personalization of the health service flurry? That was before we had the dismantling of the health service. First, we had the personalization of the health service. Well, but personalization has a serious side. There, there has been a field of artificial intelligence for n over half a century and for at least two decades that field has been applied to education but you hardly ever see any of it in educational contexts. You can trawl the world for um, artificially intelligent programs that purport to teach somebody something other than just um, drilling and practicing in some artificially intelligent way. So personalization has matured to sensible use of what technologies might be able to do in the future. And one of those things, by the way, is not replacing us, you'll be glad to know. Um, there's now much less debate than there used to be about whether technology will replace teachers. It will be far beyond anybody here's lifetime and probably their grandchildren too before a computer is anywhere near as intelligent as a human being. And they can't even, we can't get off first base on that until we know how human beings' brains work, and that's just a field that is being born as we speak. 
Uh, the other theme is um, productivity. Doing things in a more productive way, productive of our time, uh, than was possible before we had the technology. So here's some numbers. There are eight major large projects. There are many thematic areas that the program is contributing to. There are more than 30 institutions across the UK. There are 150, more than 150 researchers and hundreds and hundreds of outputs which are all on the website, obviously. And again, probably difficult to read the white um, uh, text, but there they are. If we, I'll make these slides available. Oh, they're away. Yes, okay, good. So let me just um, re put a ring around the AI Ed strand, which is coming to fruition now. It's really interesting to look and see how artificial intelligence in education might be poised to make a real difference. And then, but remember that like all technological innovations that purport to have something to do with teaching and learning, the success and failure is in our hands, not in the hands of the technicians who build the systems. Well, much less importantly in their hands than it is in our hands. Um, Technology-enhanced research, let me just decode that, because I think that's something that is going to change the way we think about assessment. I think one of my colleagues is very fond of using the analogy of how racing cars used to be controlled by the pits, and you had people with clipboards and timers that um, timed the laps and wrote down stuff, and it's all done by hand, of course. And now the cars are telemetered like rockets. There's... there's data telemetry taking place which is beamed in real time into the pits and the engineers know what's going on at every minute, moment, every second, every nanosecond of the, of the race. And I think teaching and learning would really benefit from that, particularly in the following way. At the moment, much of what we teach is constrained not only by the pencil and paper that it was designed with, but by the feasibility of genuinely assessing what the student knows and doesn't know. And that's understandable and laudable because assessment is a part of, good assessment is a part of good learning and good teaching. But if we could find ways in which students could be assessed unobtrusively, continuously, helpfully, formatively, that really would be a powerful tool in our hands. And I think we will see in the next five or 10 years um, that kind of phenomenon taking place. Okay, I'm going to just pick, almost at random, not quite, because you're a higher education audience, just two, or if there's time, three examples of research that's going on under the banner of the Technology Enhanced Learning Programme. One is the Ensemble Programme that was born in Cambridge and is now at Liverpool Hope University. And they are trying to build tools and uh, using the semantic web. And the semantic web was an idea of Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web. And basically, it's websites with meaning. So, at the moment, if you look up a word in Google, what Google does is it looks for the occurrences of that word. In a rather sophisticated way, but still, it's essentially a counting exercise. What we don't have is tools that can look at websites and infer and deduce what the website is actually about to attribute meaning to it, unless human beings have gone to the trouble of tagging those web pages and websites, which most of us never have time to do. I, I can't even be bothered to tag my own papers, and I know that people are very... You know, it's a time-consuming thing, and you have to give it a lot of thought, and it's very difficult. So the idea that computers might be able to infer meaning, if you like, tag their own websites, is a very beguiling idea. And the Ensemble project, led by Professor Patrick Carmichael in Liverpool, is one of those projects. So I'll leave you with that thought. Um, the, there are a couple of projects of which the Personal Inquiry Project is one, which are saying, we will use technology that children have in their pockets to teach them about science. 
And it turns out that, for example, I can see quite a few people clutching iPhones. I'm an iPhone clutcher, just like everybody else. But in the iPhone, there's an um, accelerometer. There's a way of measuring temperature. There's a compass. There are all kinds of scientific... People are walking around. We all are walking around with a scientific laboratory in our pocket. And scientific laboratories are a good way to study all kinds of phenomena, not just scientific phenomena. So I just thought I'd give you um, that example. And now I just want to give you the probably our most frightening example of all, which is represented here in this room. This is actually about dental students drilling teeth. Now, the frightening part is that they have built this system which costs a tiny fraction of what it would have cost before their research. This is based at King's College. Professor Margaret Cox was the principal investigator of this project. But the worst part is they even have the sound effects working perfectly. So when you're drilling the teeth, you get that awful sound that just jars in the back of your head. But joking apart, they have actually pointed to something that goes far beyond whether or not students can realistically drill artificial teeth on a screen. That's in itself quite an interesting question. But what they point to is haptic um, devices controlling computers. That is to say, exploiting our senses of touch and also gesture, which are more or less completely um, neglected by traditional computer applications. Beginning to come in, actually, I know my new computer lets me do all kinds of gestures with up to four fingers. So swiping with three fingers means something different from swiping at the screen with four fingers. So gesture is beginning to make an appearance in my computer is a, is a Mac. It's a kind of commodity. You can buy it in Dixon's, for goodness sake. And it's beginning to incorporate elements of gesture. But I think the whole notion of gesture and touch will become more and more important. I said it was my last example, but I'm going to give you one more, which I know that about a third of you have already been introduced to. And this is my colleague Diana Lorillard's project, um, in which she's building what she calls, she and her colleagues, building what she calls a learning designer. Um, a world in which teachers can explore not only what, how and what they teach, but explore their own learning about teaching, their own understandings of teaching. So, so many of us just teach because it feels, do we teach in a particular way because it feels okay? Or we teach in a particular way because that was how we were taught. And we, most of us, except people like me who actually are professors of mathematics education or something education, but most people are too busy to reflect on whether or not they have a coherent theoretical underpinning of how they teach or what the, what, who else is doing what that might be similar or from whom they might learn. And what Diana has done very successfully is build a system which facilitates that kind of understanding, that kind of activity. And it's unusual, by the way, it incorporates elements of artificial intelligence, but it's unusual because those kind of environments in the education literature are almost always the preserve of students. Building students' exploratory learning environments is a powerful part of that literature. But giving powerful learning environments to teachers is an unusual aspect of using technology and it's very welcome that it's receiving some attention. Okay, I think I'm going to stop uh, just by giving you the website and thank you very much for your I'm really happy if there is time. There is, Steve. I think there is. Thank you. Thanks very much.